Hey, morning, everybody. Appreciate the patience. It's uh, it's great to be with folks again, to see people again. And uh, thank you. It's a beautiful facility. So thank you to the organizers and thank you to the volunteers for making it all happen and getting us all back together safely. Um, uh, before I get started, I, I did want to just share a little bit of a personal story of my own connection to the Raleigh-Durham area. I did live here briefly about 20 years ago, but it goes back a bit before that. Um, so my dad's family migrated to the U.S. from China and from Hong Kong in the late 60s and early 70s, and they settled in the, in the Northeast. And my mom's family uh, was from upstate New York. And that's where my parents met. They met in 1972. They were, I think they were both right out of high school. And I don't know if you've ever been to upstate New York in the wintertime. It's, it's different than <laughs> this. It's cold. And I, I think the winter of 72, 73 was, was worse than normal. So they got to the spring of 73 and were like, yeah, that's it. We're heading south. Um, and so they were, their plan was to drive to Florida and, and live in Florida. And they were, you know, they're right out of high school. They didn't have a lot of money. So they got in the car, went, and then they ran out of money. When they ran out of money, they happened to be here in the Raleigh-Durham area. So this is where they set up their lives and, and their family. And my sister was born here. Um, both of our, actually all three of my dad's sisters moved down from the Northeast. They all went to NC State. So I don't know if there's any Wolfpack folks here. Um, they all met their husbands here and started their family. So it's a really special a special place for me and my family. I'm sure for the folks who are locals, it's special for you as well. Um, and it's great to be back here, especially for B-Sides. I mean, B-Sides, as, as Ashley mentioned, it's an amazing event. It's an amazing community. Uh, I'm from the Bay Area. I've uh, been to B-Sides SF a bunch. I've been to the Las Vegas one and then now uh, RDU, and I'm sure this is going to be the best one. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the day. I've, I love that it's it's by the community, it's for the community, and it's really explicit that it's trying to you know, take different perspectives and different views on our field. And that's what I want to try to do today is maybe give a little bit of a different, uh, you know, take on your normal information security conference. So that's what we'll do. So we'll get started. And, um, you know, with any kind of complex topic like cybersecurity, I always think it's helpful to think about, you know, analogies and comparisons and metaphors that maybe help us think about it a different way. And for the purpose, at least to get us kicked off here, I wanted to talk about like this, this idea of a healthy lifestyle or like personal health and well-being. I would say I don't think there's any real ambiguity about like what the recommendations are, right? We're supposed to get eight hours of sleep. I don't know how many of y'all do that. I think, I think it's supposed to drink like eight glasses of water, you know, eat decently, don't smoke, don't drink too much, get some exercise. Like we, we generally know what to do, but it's hard, right? It's, it's for many reasons. Like it's hard to wake up early and go for a run. For me, I love pizza. It's hard to say no to an extra slice of pizza or another glass of wine. And, you know, those are, those are like simpler examples. But if you look at um, what the Department of Health and Human Services says, they actually have this, this concept of what they call the social determinants of health. And there's all kinds of structural and systemic barriers to being healthy. Everything from access to health insurance to income instability. And it's pretty easy to see like how this fits together. Right? You can imagine maybe you're like a single parent. Uh, you've got to work a couple of jobs to make ends meet. Right? You've got tons of stress in your life. You don't have health insurance. You don't have time to exercise. You don't have time to make healthy meals. It, there's a lot of barriers. So it's not enough to know what to do. There's clearly... Like we need some help to get to the how. And I would say we're, we're pretty much in the same boat in security. There's no shortage of guidance out there, right? This is just the random sampling. You got the NIST cybersecurity framework. You've got the Center for Internet Security, PCI, if you're into compliance. Um, and you know, one thing, speaking of recommendations, so I know like security folks are really opinionated, but <laughs> my guess is, I would wager on this. If I were to ask everybody in this audience, tell me the top five recommendations you have to improve security for individuals and even for organizations, my guess would be there would be two of them that would be on almost every list. And those are two-factor authentication and patching. And I just think like anecdotally, look, those are just good things. Like they've been around forever. They're kind of unambiguously good. And actually, even if you look at the data, so if you're familiar with Verizon's DBIR, the data, data breach investigation report, they basically look at all incidents that happen in a year. And in 2015, they looked 
And they said, for all the incidents that happened, like what were the controls that would have that would have addressed the most issues? And the top two were two-factor authentication and patching, about 24% each. So we've got the data. We all anecdotal, anecdotally know that these are good things to do. They've been around forever, right? So uh, how do you think, are we doing great in these areas? No? Kind of a grumpy audience. I don't know. Let's, let's, let's see. Let's, <laughs> let's dive in. Let's look at two-factor authentication first. So this is from Twitter's uh, account transparency report they just published. And this is not a, uh, you know, I'm not um, banging on Twitter at all. They've got 2.3% of adoption, 2.3% adoption in their user base. They've been around for 15 years. It's a, they've got a 200 million users and they have 2.3% of their users use two-factor authentication. And I know you're thinking, you're thinking, well, it's a consumer service, it's social media, people don't care about their credentials. I'm sure enterprise is way better. <laughs> it, it, actually, it actually is, it, it, it is way better. It all, but lean, you know, way better is all relative. It's, uh, this, is from, this is from a really good talk uh, at RSA last year by this, uh, the identity team at Microsoft. And they basically said, this isn't like Microsoft employees, but this is in their enterprise environment, right? This is a huge environment. They have a billion monthly users. They see 30 billion authentication events a day. 11% use MFA. That's the state of enterprise. This is, this, this is on uh, YouTube. I, a really great talk, go check it out. So, theory, yeah, we're doing like between four and five times better in the enterprise and consumer, but that's, it's hard to get excited about 11%. Patching though, right? We're, I, I know we've, we've nailed patching. So let's dig in a little bit. Uh, actually, we haven't. This is from CISA. This is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. They published this uh, earlier this summer. They basically did an analysis of the most frequently exploited bugs in 2020. Most of them are years old. The number seven bug, number seven vulnerability most exploited last year was from 2017. Apologies, my, my little uh, animation is off there. But so these are years old, right? So, and even if we go even more recent, this is actually just a couple of weeks ago, there was some neat research published by, uh, I think it was Palo Alto Networks. Uh, and they have one of these, you know, it's always great when you have a named vulnerability, when you can have a funny name. Uh, this thing called Azure Scape, which was a cross account container takeover in a, a Microsoft Azure service called Azure Container Instances. It turns out ACI or Azure Container Instances was running a run C, which is part of the container runtime from 2016 that had, that had multiple well-known container escape vulnerabilities. And the thing that like is, is troubling to me is this service only went GA in 2018. So even when it went live, it was already vulnerable and there were three years later. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to beat up on Microsoft, um, but I would organization in the entire world that knows the importance of patching and vulnerability management, it's Microsoft. And I'll take a, let's take a little a trip down memory lane. Does anybody use Windows 98? They had Windows updates since Windows 98. So this is like, it's probably an operating system that's probably older than some people in this room. And they had automatic updates. So they, Windows has actually had automatic updates as a core part of their operating system since 2000. So that's two decades, two plus decades. They've actually had Patch Tuesday since 2003. Again, not trying to beat up on Microsoft, but they clearly know what they're doing, but they still have problems. And at this point, you're probably saying, wow, this is really depressing talk, Jason. This is like, this is like a keynote. We're supposed to be positive, right? We're supposed to be, um, we're supposed to get excited. And, um, you know, I really just, really just kind of use that as an example. It, it's, it's one thing to know what to do. It's a different thing to get it done. And that's really what I want to talk about. But I don't want to, I don't want to talk about changing the industry. I'm not, I mean, you know, frankly, I'm not that ambitious. And, you know, I, I tend to be more practical. But I do want to talk about changing ourselves, like changing the people in this room and the people watching this talk about how we approach you know, our careers and, and this industry. Uh, because I really do think that, that by some adjustments, we can, we can actually have more fun at work and we can actually have better outcomes for the organizations that we work for. And um, you know, I think, as mentioned with B-Sides, it's all about learning and, and sharing. And so I, you know, I had a bunch of jobs in my career and I was, yeah, you know, I spent the most time at Netflix. I was there a little bit over 10 years. And I, um, I started at Netflix as an engineer 
And Netflix was one of the first big companies to go into the public cloud. So this is around, I started in 2011. So I really started to help them use AWS securely. And, you know, I kind of grew the team from there and I led the team. And by the time I left a few months ago, the team was about 150 folks. And, uh, you know, so the company had grown a lot and had seen all kinds of change. And, you know, we did everything from going to the public cloud to, you know, becoming a global service to creating our own entertainment studio, which was, you know, it's not really something you get a lot of chances to do in your career. And, you know, I learned a bunch from my coworkers at Netflix and just from like steering through everything. So that's kind of what I want to share. You know, I don't, I won't get super specific or super technical, but, you know, just share some of the learnings I found and hopefully folks can kind of abstract that away and apply that to your, to your day to day. And I want to start in, and just to kind of like to summarize sort of what we'll, we'll look at really three areas. So self, we'll start with ourselves and kind of how we approach things, how we approach our own lives, how we approach the field, go about going to culture, which is the culture of the organizations that we work in. And then talk about strategy, like how do we actually develop strategy and apply that and make sure everyone's aligned. And starting with self and kind of taking care of ourselves. And you may say, well, why is self-care important for cybersecurity? Isn't it a really like, like no low stress field? Well, it's, it's really not. But I think, you know, one of my favorite metaphors, just generally, if you've ever been on an airplane in the United States, you've heard the safety briefing, right? They say in the event of loss of air cabin pressure, I've heard this so many times, you put on your own mask first. And really what they mean is if you're going to help people, whether it's your family, your friends or your coworkers, you got to be taking care of yourself, right? If you're not like if, if you're having issues or you're not like able to bring your full self to work, then you're going to have it's going to be you're not going to be able to contribute as much. So let's start there. And I want to start first with, uh, you know, managing life. And we, we've talked about work life balance for a decade, for forever. And but these last 18 months or so with COVID have been extreme. Like I would say, I don't know about y'all, but there is no work life balance. I mean, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to work from home. But, you know, you're working from your dining room table. You got to do like Zoom with friends. It's like there's no, you know, there's no end. There's no separation. And, you know, I would get this message every week. This is like the you know, the Apple screen time. And I'd be like, yeah, I know Apple. I, I know I'm using the phone a lot. Like we're all plugged in. It was too much. And, and I would say, you know, as, as much benefit as the internet has and social media, it can also be damaging, right? So if I think about social media, right, you, you log into LinkedIn and you see everybody, oh, this person got promoted or this person's having great success. And then you log into Facebook and, you know, so-and-so's daughter just got into Harvard or something. And, you know, you go into Instagram and people are doing, you know, workouts and their vacation and they're cooking all kinds of interesting stuff. And you, 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 I think it's just natural to think, well, hey, I want that. I want to have a great career. I want to be healthy. I want to be taking great vacations. And, you know, I think there's nothing wrong with that. But I would say where we start to run into, into issues is we're trying to do it all at once. And one of the really this is like one of the most influential things I ever read in my whole career, my entire life, was this article here from uh, Eric Sinaway. It was in the Harvard Business Review about 10 years ago. And it's entitled, No, You Can't Have It All. And you could probably guess from the title uh, what that means. And what, what Sinaway says is, he basically says, instead of just work life, he actually has seven different dimensions of your life. So hobbies, you know, spirituality, physical health, work, family, and you really have to be explicit about who you want to be in each of these dimensions at any given time. Like over the course of life, you can probably, you know, do great things and all these things. But at any given time, you want to be able to live, like there's only 24 hours in a day. So just, to, just as an example, imagine you're like you're maybe a young, young married couple. You've got, you've got children um, and you're both working. And that's a lot already, right? You've got kids, you've got two careers. And then maybe one of the partners says, hey, I want to I want to, you know, get further in my career. So I'm going to do like an executive MBA program at night. So then you got kids, you got career, you got night school. That's it's it's you're starting to get a lot of balls in the air. It's probably not a great time to like try to learn Italian or train, train for a marathon or start volunteering for like your church group as a, as a treasurer or something like that. There's a limited amount of time. 
And we sort of fool ourselves if we think we can be excellent in everything all the time. So what Sinue does, he has this really nice set of questions around your priorities. Like, what do you want to emphasize, right? I would say as humans, we don't really like to say no, right? We want to try to do it all, but it's really about understanding what the costs are, what the trade-offs are, and then making sure that you can let go, right? A lot of it is about learning to let go, learning to say no. So that's kind of, you know, how, how do you think about your overall priorities? And I would say also with, with that framework, you want to revisit that, right? Five years from now is going to be different than now. And you also want, if you're in a relationship, or you want to be talking about that with your partner as well. And so the second, the second element here around self is about keeping perspective. And so in security, like what is, what is our goal in security? Like, can you win? Like, is there, is there like a finish line? Is there, there, there's not really a finish line. Is there, it's like, what does success look like? Especially, you know, I always think, a lot of what we're trying to do is prevent bad things from happening. So what does success look like when that's kind of what you're trying to do? And if something bad does happen, we're trying to help our organizations, you know, return to some normalcy because really our organ, the places that we work, they're not in business to not get hacked, right? They're in business to stream movies or sell shoes or whatever it is. And then security is part of that. We are supporting it. And a framework that I really like to sort of do the kind of like mental shift to get into this mode is uh, what's called the infinite game. And you may be familiar with this. Uh, Simon Sinek wrote a book about it just a couple of years ago called The Infinite Game. And it's an extension of an earlier book, I think from the 80s from James Kars. And if you're not familiar, just, just from a definitions perspective, so finite games, we're used to playing these. This is what we all play, like think basketball. In a finite game, You've got consistent rules, you know who's playing, and there's a defined result. Right in basketball, it's five on five, whoever's got the most points at the end wins, done, go on with your life. In an infinite game, though, there are no rules. And players come and go, and you may not even know who's playing. And the goal is to keep playing, the goal is to continue. There is no finish line. So what is an infinite game? Well, I would say life is the ultimate infinite game right? Business is an infinite game, right? There's no, there's no winning in business. You want to stay in business. Poli politics is an infinite game. So within politics, you have discrete finite games. So an individual election cycle is a finite game. You have known candidates, you have a set of rules, you got a winner. But politics over the long term, it, like if you look at the US system, the multi-party system, each one of those parties has a long-term agenda that they're trying to bend things towards, right? And it's an infinite game. It never ends. And I would say absolutely security completely falls into this concept of an infinite game. And for me, like, as you sort of think about this model, like one of the most dangerous things to me is if you are going into security, which I would say is an infinite game with the mindset that it's a finite game. And so I'll, I'll, I'll tick off some characteristics here of a finite mindset. And you can, you can kind of gauge to yourself whether you've ever worked with, with folks like this. They're thinking near term, right? Like, what do we do today? Like, wh what do we do today? And they're thinking everything is high stakes, right? You got to win at all costs. Like, we got to get this patch installed. Like, we, we, we have to say no to using this thing, right? There's a lot of that no, because everything is like, everything is urgent. And it's, you want to be right. You want to get your way, right? That's kind of the, it's very transactional, right? Because you're not thinking long term. You're thinking about short term wins. The, the infinite mindset, I would say, when applied to security, it's going to be quite different. You're thinking long term, right? And when you think long term, it's a sustained effort, right? If you are like sprinting every day when you work in security, you're going to get burned out really, really quick. It's, it's a long game. So you have to think about it that way. It's about reaching compromise and it's about making progress, right? I, that's really what I think about security. It's you're trying to leave things better than when, when you got in, right? Because there, there is no finish line. There's no winning, right? We're just trying to make things better. And it's about building relationships. So it's that shift, right? I would, I would almost guarantee everybody here has worked with somebody in that left-hand column where they're, everything's urgent, everything's anxious. anxious. And when, when you think about security, and this is sort of like the third part of this, this talk about the self, is uh, managing stressful situations. It's very tied to that idea of finite versus infinite. And 
like, like we talked about earlier, there's a lot of stressful situations in security. Incidents, vulnerabilities, they happen. They don't go away. And in stressful situations, the, the model that I really like to kind of think about, especially in security, is this idea of what's called a step-down transformer. So in electricity, a step-down transformer takes a high voltage signal and turns it to low voltage. That's not, that's not exactly what we're talking about in security, but this is a concept from a field of leadership study called resilient leadership. And here's a book here, there's, a, there's also a really interesting PDF. And a step-down transformer, when you're talking about it at work or even any time in life, is you make things relatively less stressful, less anxious, less reactive. Like, have you ever walked into a room like where there's an incident and like people are, they're heated? Does it help to like go in there and like start yelling and screaming and pounding out? Does that make things better? That never makes things better. If you go in there and you're relatively less, it doesn't mean you're a robot, right? But you're less anxious. And just to kind of use a personal anecdote, uh, it was a couple of years ago I was working, there was an incident going on at Netflix I think it was a vulnerability came in through our bug bounty program, which, yeah, I mean, that happens all the time, right? That's the job and security. But that's not the job for the people who own those apps that are impacted, right? So I remember the uh, VP who ran that app, she called me one evening at like 8.30 or 9 at night and was very agitated, was very nervous because she was worried that a vulnerability in her application was going to cause like a big impact for Netflix. So, you know, I was just kind of talking her through what the findings were and you know, what, how we were working with her team to remediate and kind of the mitigation timeline. And you know, after a couple of minutes, she just kind of like said, Jason, I'm freaking out. Why aren't you freaking out? Are you high? And I was like, I was like, no, I mean, I mean I'm not high. I mean, this is, you know, it's a Wednesday when you work in security. <laughs> but like, if I had brought like anxiety and stress and reactivity to that conversation, that just makes things worse. But by being you know, stepping things down, that's the way to handle it. And you may be saying, you know, this is from leadership study. And you may say, well, I, I don't manage people, right? Am I a leader? And I would say, absolutely. Everybody has a, has a chance and opportunities to be a leader. And especially, and I think this is a responsibility we all need to take seriously. When there's a, when there's a crisis happening at work and security, you're the expert right? You know relatively more than most of the people involved, right? You're going to have PR, you're going to have marketing, legal, you know more. And what are you going to do with that imbalance of knowledge? And so what I, what I would ask people to do is think about a case when you were in a crisis situation, there was an imbalance of expertise, but you were the one who knew less, right? So for me, the car breaks down. I don't know anything about cars and I got to go to the mechanic. I'm stressed out. The mechanic knows more than I do. How, how is that person going to handle that situation? Are they going to take advantage of me? Are they going to talk down to me? Or even like higher stakes, think about you have a, a health issue, right? You have to, you got to go to the doctor. You got to get tested done. You don't know what's going on. You're nervous. You're highly stressed. The doctor went to medical school. I, I didn't go to medical school. How are they going to treat that? Like, what think about bedside manner, right? How they handle that is tremendously impactful, especially when you think in that context of the infinite game and you think long-term. So if there is a problem at work, a security issue, and you're the security person and you know, say something gets, gets popped and you're like, oh gee, I, I told you that was gonna happen and we told you to you know, patch that, that doesn't help, right? You're just, it just makes things worse. So what I like to think about there, like when you are, when you are the one with expertise, and it's a crisis. Think about this analogy of lowering a drawbridge. You want to lower your drawbridge. You want to create connection. Because when people know less than you do, and it's a, and it's a stressful situation, they're vulnerable, right? And you want to, you want to basically create, you, know, you want to have empathy. So you lower the drawbridge, you create connection, right? The, the alternative there is you raise the drawbridge and you create separation. And that's, that doesn't help. That's that short-term mindset. It's not thinking long-term. It's not thinking about building relationships because you got to work with these folks, right? From here on out. So that's, that's kind of, you know, taking care of yourself. We talked about priorities in our own life. We talked about the long game. We talked about reducing stress. And I want to talk about culture and strategy. And I'll talk about these, you know, at the same time because they're pretty related. And for the purpose of what we'll, what we'll talk about here, 
Culture is really about how an organization works together. It's your shared set of values, your processes. And then strategy is for how are you going to achieve your goals? How are you going to allocate resources? What decisions are you going to make? And the most famous quote in this, you know, relating to these two words from Peter Drucker many years ago, he said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And this is completely true. But what he's saying is you could have a great strategy. If it doesn't align with your organization culture, you're going to fail, right? Because culture trumps strategy. And just to make this like more real, I wanted to use this example. This is uh, my former colleague, Laura, and he's a really interesting follow on Twitter. I would suggest a follow. But he, a few months ago, he was tweeting out interview questions and like seeing responses. And, and I, I really like this one. It's basically you're a manager, you're building a tool. It's a pretty good tool. It works pretty well. It turns out somebody else at the organization has already built that, and you're, but yours is better, right? So you're in an interview situation. How would, you, how would you handle that? Role play that conversation. What Lauren is asking here is what's your strategy? Like, how are you going to handle that? So I've never, this has never happened to me personally, but if I was the one being interviewed, I would say, okay, well, what are the past experiences I can draw on that are helpful? So I would think, what's a time when I've had to have a difficult conversation with a coworker, right? What's a time when I had to try to influence a peer? What, maybe what's a time where I've had to do like a side-by-side -side feature comparison amongst products? And I think those are the right, those are the right, you know, bodies of knowledge. But the problem is, what you don't know is what's the culture of the organization? If you don't know that, you can't answer it correctly. And if you follow this thread, somebody chimes in with a really great response. It was somebody who had worked at both Amazon and Microsoft. And that person said, it depends. At Amazon, they have a really well-known principle that says it's better to have two of something than zero, right? So at Amazon, they explicitly say duplication is okay. So if you know that's the culture, you can't escalate this and be like, oh, well, uh, this thing is, that's not going to go anywhere, right? You're going to fail. And you're going to be frustrated because you think you're doing the right thing, but it's against the culture. Whereas at Microsoft, they would handle it differently. They would want to step back. They might want to talk about strategic focus. They might do some reorging. So you would handle it differently. at in other enterprise contexts, I would have failed because I wasn't taking into account the cultural context. And there's a couple of other uh, elements that are really important in the Netflix culture. One of them is freedom, what we call freedom and responsibility. You can make your own decisions. You're responsible for the outcomes. If you really want to go like a different path, you're free to do it, but you're, you're going to be on the hook for, for responsibility. And then context, not control. So this is kind of like the anti-micromanaging is like you want to make sure your teams and everybody understands the context of the company, what's important, where is the strategic alignment? Because if everyone has context, then you can make really good independent decisions. So if you think about the implications for security, right? And this is just like a highlight here. So if, if we know the culture, like the number one thing on there is encourage independent decision making. If you know that's the culture, like, would you have a bunch of like centralized approvals and, you know, top down approach and like, it's not a place where you ask permission, right? So if you're trying to like put together structures that emphasize, the, which a lot of traditional security programs do, it's not going to work. Then there's also share information openly, 
Well, if you know the company and the culture wants to share information openly, you probably don't want to go to like a default deny, lock everything down approach, right? Because people value access to information. And then, you know, avoiding rules. So if I know the company wants to avoid rules, I'm going to be careful about policy, right? So the cultural lessons there really just abstractly is you want to understand how the, how the organization works. Like what is the risk tolerance? How do you make decisions? And then you want to combine that with your own past experience, right? Because that's, that's why you got the job, your past experience. And then it really comes together when you look at it through the lens of the culture of the organizations you're working in. So then, you know, strategy is kind of the final piece we'll talk about here and strategy you, you talk about like, there's so many books on strategy and um, you could read forever about it if you'd like to. Um, I really like this quote to summarize strategy in a nutshell. This is from Reed. He's the Netflix co-founder and CEO. And you know, he says here, strategy is pain, right? It has to be difficult because it's about what you don't do, right? Remember when we were talking about self-care and you know, deciding what you wanna prioritize? It's hard to say no. Right. And I would say, you know, in some theoretical perfect world where you've got infinite resources and infinite time, I don't think, does anybody have infinite budget? And, and like, you don't. So you, if you know you have constraints, let's work within the constraints. What, how do you say no? And the way that Netflix articulates strategy is through a model called strategic bets. And strategic bets are very explicit and transparent choices but they're choices between multiple reasonable approaches, right? Because, you know, if you think about it, like if you're trying to climb, if you want to get to the top of the mountain, there's probably more than one way up there, but you got to pick one. And they create focus and they also, we talked about context, not control. It provides context. So if you're strategically aligned, if you understand the bet, then you can make good decisions. And these are some examples from the, uh, these are available on the Netflix investor relations site from the long-term view. You can see it there. It says Netflix is a focused passion brand. It's not a do everything brand. Starbucks, not 7-Eleven. Southwest, not United. Right. And then below that, we don't offer pay-per-view or free ad supported content. Those are fine business models. Right. So that's an acknowledgement. Like, yeah, you can. There are other ways to do it. We're not going to do that, though. We're going to do this. And by being explicit, being transparent, being consistent, Right. Because that, that's, that's on, on the public Internet. So then clearly the external world knows how, how Netflix is moving. So that creates tremendous amount of strategic alignment internally. There's no confusion about are we doing ads? No. I mean, it's right there. I mean, so this provides a lot of consistency and a lot of context for folks to work in. And if you're interested in the way, like a little bit more detail about how strategy bets work, my former colleague, John May, he's, he leads the platform security team at Netflix, wrote a really, really nice article summarizing that called Place Your Bets. And I wanted to talk about some specific security strategy bets that we created, you know, as we built the team. And, and these were all in the context of the culture. And so I want to kind of do a bit of a deep dive into one of them and then kind of, you know, we'll give a few other examples just so you have a sense of how strategy bets work. And the first one, I was actually telling some folks at dinner last night. So the, the last social event I went to pre-COVID, so I guess probably like February of 2020, was a security meetup, um, like happy hour in San Francisco. And, you know, there was a bunch of folks from other tech companies. And I was having a conversation with um, somebody from another really well-known uh, tech brand uh, on their security team. And she was telling me that their CTO wants all engineers to think security first. And I said, that's great. I think that's a great strategic position. And I'm, I'm sure like we like that would be a nice place to work because like think about what falls out of your CTO saying that. Right. It's, it's really a nice rallying cry because everybody's like, yes, security first. Right. A lot of us have been have been trying to reach for that for many years. It also demonstrates your commitment and it, and it makes clear like how you're going to prioritize. Right. I said, that's that's amazing. I would say Netflix has a dramatically different approach. I said at Netflix, we want engineers to focus on what they were hired to do. These are just different approaches. They're not one of them is not right and wrong. You got to choose one that aligns with your culture. So when you say that you want engineers to focus, here's really what that means. 
is I want, I want my folks to focus. I want them to have less cognitive load, right? You, you'll know, like, it's hard to develop software. Like, you got to keep a lot of stuff in your brain, like CI and testing and source code management and deployment and observability, performance. I don't want, you know, folks worrying about security. It also recognizes specialization, right, and scarcity. Are good engineers easy to hire? Are they cheap? Right, if we hire a great algorithms engineer, I want them thinking about algorithms. I don't want them thinking about security. To me, I believe that that gives the, the best position for the company, like that's the best use of their resources. But it also drives excellence, it demands excellence from the security team. Because if that's your approach, basically the security team needs to build products and tools that are simple and easy for engineers to use to solve their security problems. Like if you're not willing to do that, if you're not gonna demand excellence out of your security team, then you can't take that approach. So this is kind of an example of like a strategic bet. And these are both completely fine ways to go about it, but you can't do both. You gotta choose, right? You wanna, we, we talked about that, like we gotta narrow, we gotta focus, we don't have unlimited resources. And if we think about a few more examples that we created in the security team over the years. One was we said we want to publicly share information. We don't want to keep it private, right? So what did that mean for us? Well, that meant we did a lot of open source. You know, we, we, I think we open sourced like 30 something projects when I was there. Did lots of peer to peer collaboration. You know, like we did a lot of conference presentations and I, th I thought that that was useful. That's why we created that bet. There's nothing wrong with being private about your security program. Like it's certainly easier to create software and not make it open source. Like that, I guarantee you that's a simpler way to do it. But we just thought, we thought it would be a net benefit for us as we built the team. And by doing that, by being explicit, like we, have, we would have this written in a document, then folks understand, okay, here's our position on conference on information sharing. They don't need to ask their manager, it's right there. The next one, and we had, I don't know, I think we had maybe 20 of these. The next one I'll, I'll just talk about briefly was, you know, we wanted to do targeted security training, not broad and compulsory training. There's nothing wrong with like having every employee do like a bunch of mandatory security awareness training. Nothing wrong with that. We just thought it would be a more effective use of our resources to do targeted training for the audiences that we thought were most impacted. So an application team that had a bug bounty finding, maybe your finance team because you're worried about business email compromise. And the last one I'll talk about is we had a, we had a saying that we would say guardrails, not gates, right? We want automated controls. We want minimal human interaction, and we want, we're not going to try to prevent every, every bug from happening. Instead, we want to focus on our ability to deploy software really quickly. We, wanted to, we want to focus on detection and response versus trying to prevent everything from happening. And you can see how the investments would fall out from there. Right? But when we say that, if, I, if we say that, then we know we're not going to put a bunch of investment in these sort of mandatory gates that people have to pass through. So just wrapping things up. So we really talked about three main areas, right? We talked about the self. And I think the real the main takeaway there is like, you gotta cultivate ways to remove stress from the overall system. So whether it's making priorities in your personal life, so to give yourself more breathing room, whether it's thinking long-term at work, or we talked about that idea of being the step-down transformer. Talked about culture, right? You definitely don't wanna push uphill. You wanna understand like, how does the organization work? And then that's how you wanna apply your expertise. And then finally with strategy, right? There's usually multiple correct or appropriate ways, but you gotta choose. You, and you wanna be explicit with your choices so that people are strategically aligned. And of course you wanna fit that direction to your culture. So that is it, and I appreciate your time. Thank you.